professional wrestling and gimmicks go hand in hand. In fact, you can say that the institution of pro wrestling itself is just one large gimmick. So over the years, especially in the last 30 years or so, with the expansion of wrestling into a nationwide cable phenomenon, one thing was for certain, and that was characters were needed, and we need our characters to most of the time be big and bright and over the top. And while more often than not, characters get represented well, the reality is, is not every character is a home run, whether in theory or in practice. Somewhere along the way, these were the wrestling characters and gimmicks that we all remember being horribly bad. Yes, there have been many top 10, top 25, or top 50 worst gimmicks of all time lists out there, but here we will settle this once and for all and decide for the first time ever the top 100 wrestling gimmicks of all time. Number 100, Damien Demento. Born Philip Tice, Damien Demento is famous for having appeared in the main event of the first ever Monday Night Raw in a losing effort to The Undertaker. Tice was trained by Johnny Rods and spent a good five years wrestling on the indie circuit before getting on with the WWF with help from the Bushwhackers. Demento stuck around for about a year and then was let go as his gimmick was strange and perhaps just a few years too late, possibly something that could have passed in the 80s, but by 1992 and 93, fans were already starting to grow weary of these sorts of gimmicks, but oh boy, Demento would be just the beginning of all that. Number 99, Puke. Puke, AKA Darren Drozdov, was a former NFL player who had a passion for wrestling and decided after football that he would give that a go. Well, Vince McMahon had gotten word that not only was Drozdov a former NFL player, but he was rather infamous for puking during an episode of Monday Night Football in front of literally millions of people on television. And somehow this morphed into a thing where he could actually literally puke on command. And thus, this became Drozdov's initial gimmick in WWE. In fact, you can see the whole meeting take place in Titan Towers. If you hunt down the movie Beyond the Mat, Drozdov was known as Puke initially and was brought in as a third member of the Legion of Doom shortly thereafter. Shortly after that, though, the Puke name was dropped and he became simply just Draws before he was tragically paralyzed in the ring and never wrestled, let alone walked ever again. Number 98, Papa Shango. Now, Papa Shango was the first of many gimmicks held by the man himself, Charles Wright. And Shango was something of a voodoo preacher, and while it was definitely effective at scaring little kids across the country, overall, it was a pretty dismal gimmick. Shango would carry a smoking skull to the ring and would also place curses upon his opponent, the most famous of which being his feud with the Ultimate Warrior. Shango placed a spell upon the Ultimate Warrior that made him bleed black blood, as well as revoltingly puke everywhere. Shango was even featured as the heel run-in during the main event of WrestleMania 8. Fortunately for Wright, he was shortly thereafter repackaged as Kama the Supreme Fighting Machine, and later on as his most successful gimmick as the Godfather, a wrestling pip. Number 97, Mortis. Mortis was a part of a trio of characters that were introduced in WCW in the year of 1996. Chris Canyon donned this mask and became a character known as Mortis. That was the arch nemesis of a Mortal Kombat ripoff character by the name of Glacier, who we will meet later on. But for now, we'll talk about Mortis. See, Mortis could have been a decent character, perhaps in another time, but during 1996, it really did not fit the feel of WCW at all. And furthermore, also could have been successful if they wouldn't have treated the whole thing 
like such a hokey B-rate movie. Number 96, The Fake Diesel. In 1996, Diesel and Razor Ramon left the WWF high and dry for WCW, where they started working under their real names, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. So just a few months later, in September of 1996, a heel Jim Ross announcing character teased that on his hotline, he would reveal that Razor Ramon and Diesel were returning to the WWF. This left many baffled at the idea that the duo could return so soon to the WWF after leaving. And in the end, the audience was swerved and Ross debuted a pair of wrestlers playing the characters of Razor and Diesel, but were quite clearly not Scott Hall and Kevin Nash that they were expecting. In particular here, we'll talk about the fake Diesel who appears here on the list simply by mercy, as this imposter was played by none other than Glenn Jacobs, who would later go on to fame as Kane. Number 95, The Kiss Demon. Dale Torborg was brought up in the WCW power plant in the mid 90s, and was first tested out with something of a NASCAR driver gimmick, but he is actually remembered more on, of course, for his stint as the KISS Demon. Eric Bischoff had worked out this huge partnership with KISS where they were to play a live concert on an episode of Monday Nitro and as well as have a character introduced that represented the band and that ended up being the KISS Demon which was portrayed by Dale Torborg here. Now let me just state that I don't think this was a bad gimmick personally but people definitely do not remember it fondly for whatever reason. Maybe it's another one of those cases where it was behind its time. Also, it didn't help that Torborg just didn't really dazzle anyone in the ring. Also not helping matters was it seems like with many wrestlers, they just put them in some stupid situations. Number 94, The Spirit Squad. This is another one of those make the list by default deals for me. As the Spirit Squad, I don't think was too terrible as a gimmick either. I mean, they served their purpose as annoying heels to feed to baby faces. However, once again, this group was the definition of annoying. And one can see why this is remembered as a horribly bad gimmick that was saddled on not one, but five up and coming wrestlers. This gimmick derailed the careers of everyone in the group sans one guy who you may know as WWE's Dolph Ziggler. Ziggler somehow stuck around, reinvented himself, and has stayed in the WWE for a close to a near 20 year run now, which is a long freaking time. Number 93, Tugboat. Oh, Fred Ottman. Uncle Fred, as Cody Rhodes knows him as. This won't be the last time we see him on this list, but here, he appears as the goofy-as-heck Tugboat. Tugboat was introduced as an ally of Hulk Hogan's during his feud with the massive earthquake. And while it seemed whatever at the time, the gimmick did not age well. And when you look back, everything from the goofy attire to the toot-toot hand motion, eventually the Tugboat would turn into a typhoon and then a shock master. But oh yes, we will get to that much, much later. Number 92, The Berserker. John Nord made the rounds in the AWA, World Class, and the Pacific Northwest from 1985 to 1991, finally making his way to the stage that was the World Wrestling Federation. And early in his career, he was known as Nord the Barbarian, so upon arriving, to Stanford, he was saddled with a character known as the Berserker, which also, I guess, was meant to be like a Viking or Barbarian of some sort. And while it could have been cool, this was goofy early 90s WWF that was really trying to cater to kids. The Berserker ended up coming out at its own goofy cartoon of itself and is remembered as one of the top 100 gimmicks of all time right here. Number 91, The Red Rooster. Harry Taylor had made quite the name for himself in the wrestling world in the 80s 
and was looked at as a bright young star upon arriving in the WWF in 1988 and was initially called Scary Terry Taylor, but was shortly thereafter rebranded as the atrocity known as the Red Rooster. The Red Rooster with Red Mohawk would cock like a hen prior to his matches, and this was seen to have been something as a huge rib on Taylor, derailing what could have been a promising WWF run. Soon he'd return to WCW as Terry Taylor, but shortly retire thereafter. Number 90, Quang. Ah yes, nothing quite says terrible gimmick that a Puerto Rican man playing a Japanese ninja. But that is exactly what we received here with this guy named Quang. Quang was alleged to be a master martial artist from the Orient, complete with the spewing green mist. But in reality, this was a gimmick given to who we would later know as Savio Vega. Vega was a respected name in Puerto Rico upon coming to the WWE, but was saddled with this silly gimmick and eventually able to remove the mask and become himself again. While Savio Vega himself had modest success with that gimmick, at least he was no longer under a hood and pretending to be a different nationality. Number 89, No Way Jose. No Way Jose showed some promise in his early days in NXT, but when called to the WWE main roster was given Adam Rose's old gimmick of being the guy that dances to the ring with an entourage, and that was it. That was literally all he ever did, and most of the time, guess what? He would lose. No Way Jose quite simply was a character and a gimmick that was never going to have any ceiling, and that's why he appears here on this list. It's not like he was bad or that the gimmick was necessarily bad, just had been done before and had zero upside, so much so that Jose lasted all but a year or so on the WWE main roster before being shipped away in June of 2020. Number 89, The Master Blaster. In the early 90s WCW, Kevin Nash was a man of many gimmicks. He was first brought in as part of a tag team called The Master Blasters and eventually the team was split and Nash became not just one of the Master Blasters, but the Master Blaster. And the Blaster was a goofy monster gimmick. I think the idea was that they were aliens, but also looked like a stunt double off of the movie Predator. Either way, the Master Blaster was booked somewhat typical to today's WWE booking as a monster that squashes dudes for a while and then creative gives up on them and books them to lose and the rest is downhill from there. Well, that is the exact story of what happened to the blaster. Fortunately for Nash though, things turned out pretty okay. Number 87, Dancing Vladimir Kozlov. Vladimir Kozlov was introduced on WWE TV and was booked quite simply as a Russian born powerhouse that squashed guys on TV. You see a pattern developing here. Anyway, this played out rather quickly and WWE got bored with this character and decided they would freshen it up by sticking Kozlov with a goofy dancing gimmick. As you could tell, this would also be a theme with this list as WWE has made a habit of doing this sort of thing and that is all over throughout the years. When they are done with a guy like this, they stick him out there and make him do stupid things that tortures the person, entertains no one, and eventually the said person is out of a job. Number 86, the artist formerly known as Prince Iakea. Wrestling and music mix very well together when it comes to entrance music and hype videos and that sort of thing. Past that though, it has been shown over and over through the years that mixing music and wrestling as far as gimmicks go is just always a bad idea. Such was the case here with one Prince Iakea. 
Iakea was a fledgling undercard talent in the late 90s WCW, but did have an interesting run with the WCW TV title. And upon Vince Russo's entrance to the company as head writer, Iakea was reimagined as this gimmick, which was a play off of Prince. Without getting into the whole Prince story, all I can really say here is maybe a decade earlier this has a chance of working. But overall, if you ever come across this on an old WCW show, just be prepared to be bored to death. Number 85, Heidenreich. Heidenreich in the end was another generic monster character that popped up on WWE TV in 2004. The act seemed to have promise as he was eventually given hopeful gimmicks like being paired with Paul Heyman and briefly becoming one of the Road Warriors. However, Heidenreich will always be remembered for the weird things about his character like the little Jimmy doll that he would talk to in his head and his apparent backstage violation of Michael Cole. His brief run came to an end in late 2005, but Heidenreich, to his credit, would gut it out on the indies for years before finally calling it a day. Number 84, Thurman Sparky Plug. When people talk about the goofy gimmicks launched as part of the WWF new generation, they think of guys like T.L. Hopper and the Goon, and somehow Bob Holly and his race car gimmick get a pass here, but not on this list, pal. Bob Holly was a real life race car driver, so in theory, maybe this wasn't entirely a bad gimmick, but the goofy attire and the goofy name of Thurman Sparky Plug were the antithesis of early 90s cheesiness. Bob Holly would eventually get the name changed to Bob Spark Plug Holly and eventually dropped the spark plug and race car gimmick entirely for his most famous persona of Hardcore Holly. Number 83, The Booty Man. Ed Leslie, you could say, was a man of a thousand gimmicks. In the 80s, he was Hulk Hogan's right-hand man and insanely over as Brutus the Barber Beefcake. But when Hogan left for WCW in 1994, Hogan had his trademark name intact, but Ed Leslie did not and therefore was not allowed to use the Brutus character. The Booty Man was the second to last in a long list of gimmicks that followed Ed Leslie in WCW. Ed's duties as the Booty Man included wearing sheer pants, dancing badly, and hanging out with DDP's wife Kimberly, aka the Booty Babe. Number 82, Relic. It's TNA Wrestling in 2007 and we were treated to a hyped up debut for a guy named Relic, which you see was killer spelled backwards, get it? The character was brought in around the time that Dustin Rhodes experimented with his horrible Black Rain character. This was actually Johnny the Bull Stamboli in a mask. The gimmick gave off super bad Glacier WCW vibes and died a slow death on Impact TV. And believe it or not, the character was actually the creation of Stamboli himself. He created this persona on the Indies, and it was originally known as Red Rum. But shortly after his TNA debut, the company changed the name to Relic. Sadly, Relic didn't win very many matches, as you may have guessed. Number 81, the fake Razor Ramon. Ah, yes, in the first episode, we covered the fake Diesel, Glenn Jacobs, as well as the fake Razor Ramon. Here, a man by the name of Rick Bogner. The pair, of course, daunted with the unenviable task of trying to fill the shoes of two of the WWF's biggest stars who had just left for seemingly greener pastures in WCW. And here, the fake razor is slightly higher on the list, mainly due to the fact that the man himself, Rick Bogner, didn't end up doing much else, at least as far as the American wrestling scene goes. Bogner had some success in Japan, so it wasn't all bad for him. But his gimmick makes this list. Bogner wrestled his last match in 2012. 
and sadly died of a heart attack at 49 years old in 2019. Number 80, Adam Rose. Ah yes, Adam Rose. Previously in the countdown, I covered No Way Jose. Now it's time for Adam Rose to clock in and serve time on the list. Rose was brought up as something of a guy who talked like Russell Brand and was a total party animal. Hey! Rose would be accompanied to the ring by an entourage who became known as the Rosebuds. And there was actually a running joke for a while about the guy who was in the huge white bunny costume that was part of the said Rosebud entourage. The bunny got over more than Rose did. And shortly thereafter, while Rose and the guy who played the bunny, Justin Gabriel, were both soon out of jobs, and no way Jose would take over this gimmick for a while before being ousted from the company himself. Number 79, Skinner. Skinner was a man by the name of Steve Kern, who by the time he became Skinner already had tons of experience under his belt wrestling mainly in Florida and Tennessee. And in the summer of 1991, Kern debuted as Skinner for the WWF. And look, I know this one may not be as terrible as some of the rest, but come on. An alligator hunter from the Florida Everglades takes up a career in wrestling. It's amazing what went through the minds of wrestling writers during this era. Also interesting to note here that Kern would later go on to take over the Doink persona from Matt Bourne for a while. And that was pretty much it when it comes to Kern, Skinner, and the WWE. Number 78, Polka Dot Dusty Rhodes. Man, Vince McMahon, some things change the more they stay the same. And Vince over the years has made a habit sometimes out of doing his best and possibly go out of his way to embarrass certain talent that had one time opposed him but now found themselves working for him. It's quite fascinating really. So in this case with Dusty Rhodes, Dusty of course after being a huge draw for the NWA for the better part of the 1980s, Dusty found himself on Vince McMahon's doorstep in 1990 and McMahon of course instead of using Dusty as a big time main eventer coming into the WWF no Dusty was saddled with a ridiculous set of polka dot tights that even though it was the 90s everyone knew these looked completely terrible and hideous Dusty's run up north was short as soon as he could no longer even hold up a WWE entertainment style as his body was giving out Nonetheless, though, it was Dusty Rhodes, and somehow he managed to get over the polka dots and still get over. Still doesn't make this any less terrible. Number 77, the Comet Kid slash Max Moon. Max Moon is quite the interesting story. You see, this gimmick, believe it or not, we can actually blame on the performer here. The wrestling world knows him better as Conan. Conan based this character off of an anime that he saw while working in Japan. In this gimmick, he would be this super alien who could shoot some sort of sparkles into the crowd or something along those lines. Anyway, the idea was pitched to Vince McMahon, who actually liked it and reportedly spent something along the lines of $13,000 designing a costume for this and the whole bit. Conan worked WWF TV under the names The Latin Fury, El Relampago, While the Suit, and all that was being worked out. Then the comic Kid debuted and had three matches, and somewhere along the way, things got so heated between Conan and McMahon that Conan left the company, and the goofy suit was given to Paul Diamond, who rechristened the gimmick as Max Moon. Number 76, Just Joe. Just Joe was just boring. Now, Joe E. Legend, we would later go on to know him during the Russo era of WCW. But before that, though, we had this ultra forgettable WWF run here as Just Joe. You see, 
he was a guy, his name was Joe, and that was that. He was Just Joe. Just Joe debuted on the July 2nd, 2000 episode of Sunday Night Heat as a guy who had a Don't Shoot the Messenger gimmick, and that was it. It was Don't Shoot the Messenger, and his name was Just Joe. Became a pretty lame running joke for at least a small period of time, and this is one of those cases of either someone trying to be more than clever or someone that just wasn't trying at all. Number 75, Perry Saturn and Moppy. Perry Saturn was a respected workhorse wrestler in ECW and WCW upon arriving in WWE in 2000 as part of the Radicals group. And Saturn was perhaps always the lowest on the totem pole in the group, but he further buried himself when one day he just decided that he would start shooting on his opponent, an enhancement talent by the name of Mike Bell. Well, the story goes that as punishment for this, WWE writers decided to craft a storyline where Saturn would get hit in the head repeatedly and suffer concussions that led to brain damage, that led to him carrying around a mop, and acting like it was a person named Moppy. Moppy was Saturn's best friend in the WWE pretty much until being released in November of 2002. Number 74, Techno Team 2000. Chad Fortune and Eric Watts debuted in the WWF in 1995. Watts being the son of legendary promoter and performer Cowboy Bill Watts. There was a significant amount of hype for this team created by the WWF. And to their credit, they did try to push these guys a little bit, but the gimmick was just terrible. They were clad in these god-awful silver jumpsuits. And most importantly, they were supposed to be from the future or something like that. A future in which apparently everyone looks like they dress in tinfoil Anyway, Techno Team didn't even make it to the year 2000. Heck, they didn't even make it a year in WWE. And instead of rebranding the guys, Vince McMahon just ended up sending them to developmental, at least the developmental territory of the time, you would say, which was the USWA. And they were never heard from again at least in WWE. Number 73, Stuart Payne. Barry Darso fans will remember him most fondly as one half of the Demolition tag team as Smash. After Demolition though, Darso would head to WCW as the Blacktop Bully. He was sent home for a while, but then returned and was mainly relegated to having matches on the B-shows like WCW Saturday Night, Pro, Worldwide, that sort of thing. During this time, he experimented with a golfing character that would ultimately end up as hole-in-one Barry Darso. Of course, there are a couple instances of him being known as Stuart Payne. Now, that name itself just deserves to be on the list, but also the idea of a wrestling golfer when you think about it, just as silly as the wrestling Gator Wrangler. Number 72, the Zodiac. Ah, here we go again, the man of a thousand gimmicks, Ed Leslie. We covered the Booty Man, and now it's time for the Zodiac. Yes, when Ed Leslie was brought into WCW as Brother Brudeye, he quickly turned heel on Hulk Hogan and became the Butcher which segued into his stint as the Zodiac. And the Zodiac was a face painted Leslie as a member of the Dungeon of Doom, where he would further attempt to foil Hulk Hogan. Oddly enough, it seems like the character was first created by Ed Leslie as part of the Mr. Nanny movie with Hulk Hogan. That's actually the first instance where you can see Leslie wearing this a good couple of years before it was introduced in WCW. Number 71, Kevin Thorne. When WWE relaunched ECW in 2006, the program aired on the Sci-Fi Network. And while in short, you see to fit in with the network, there was an initiative to create Sci-Fi type characters. So that's where you enter Kevin Thorne 
who just a couple years prior had a laughable run as Mordecai. More on that later, wink wink. But anyway, Kevin Thorne was a wrestling vampire. Of course, we never really saw him do much anything vampire-y. But he did dress in black and red, had black hair and fangs. And oh yeah, a constantly popping out of her dress Mercedes Martinez. 70, Giant Gonzalez. Giant Gonzalez was first brought into wrestling in WCW as El Gigante. And the man himself, Jorge Gonzalez, was an Argentinian basketball player who in 1988 was drafted to the Atlanta Hawks, where things didn't quite work out. But since he was in Georgia, which just so happened to be WCW's backyard, as well as a connection of Ted Turner to the Atlanta Hawks. And voila, here comes Eliganti. When WCW was done with him, he drew interest from the WWF, and they brought him in as Giant Gonzalez, which due to his size, Gonzalez was pretty intimidating, but it was decided that he needed to look more muscular and Gonzalez was saddled with this horrendous looking muscle suit, which was straight up a naked body. Of course, later on, some fur would be added to cover up Gonzalez's man parts, if you will. But Gonzalez's run fell short of a year, but did include a WrestleMania appearance, losing to The Undertaker. Number 69, IRS. Mike Rotunda, this man is another man you would say is a man of a thousand gimmicks, but he did end up with quite a few in his time. This may be a hot take here, and IRS doesn't really make a whole lot of people's lists as far as worst gimmicks go, but he settles in right here on my list, and I'll tell you why. Simply for the fact that this was the lamest gimmick ever held by Rotunda during his career. To be quite honest, pretty weird gimmickry, which included being a wrestling club guy, a sailor, and a stockbroker of some sort. I take it back, I think the stockbroker was equally as lame. Anyway, IRS would annoy crowds across the country by calling them tax cheats, and then he would usually get beat up. Oh yeah, and this guy is also the dad of Bray Wyatt and Bo Dallas. So there you go. Number 68, the American Males. Nothing says 90s tag team like a team of male strippers, am I right? That's essentially what the American Males were. Yes, the duo of Marcus Bagwell and Scotty Riggs graced our screens in the mid-90s before Bagwell went on to bigger and better things. And Riggs, I'm pretty sure, bagged my groceries last week. Anyway, the gimmick, of course, pretty cringy, and ah, yes, most of all, this gimmick was responsible for this gem of a... Number 67, Nails. Kevin Wackles is the man's name, and he began his wrestling journey in 1982, where he appeared for various promotions, including the AWA, before finally receiving a tryout with the WWF in 1989. Although it took him until 1992 to really be used on television in any kind of meaningful capacity, this was where Nails was born. Nails was a character that was a supposed ex-convict and had ties to the big boss man while the boss man was still working in the penitentiary in Cobb County. Nails' career in the WWF was cut short after he completely went ape on Vince McMahon and allegedly cornered McMahon in his office where he proceeded to choke him. This was apparently done due to money disputes that Wackles had with McMahon, and lawsuits went back and forth between the two parties, and it's safe to say that Nails won't be invited to the WWE Hall of Fame anytime soon. Number 66, Glacier. Blood runs cold was the tagline. What it should have said is crowds run cold, because that's exactly what happened whenever Glacier would darken an arena in 1996 WCW. The idea, of course, was that this gimmick was inspired 
by the Mortal Kombat video game as WCW did their best to make a wrestler look like the Sub-Zero character without actually being that character and Glacier stuck out like a sore thumb to say the least and so much so that he couldn't even feud with real people. Other characters that were equally as silly were created to rival his self, C. Mortis, who we already covered in this countdown. Number 65, The Misfits in Action. This is pretty much going to be the only time here where I use a whole group for a spot. The idea here was let's take a bunch of lovable losers and give them silly names and call them The Misfits in Action. You see, bro, is that spells M-I-A. And instead of missing in action, bro, it's Misfits because it's entertainment. The idea was fine, I suppose, but the names are what gets this atrocity into the list as we had such great babyface characters as Hugh G. Rection, Lieutenant Loco, Corporal Cajun, Sergeant AWOL, and my personal favorite, Major Stash. That's right, Major Stash. I guess that Hammer liked to smoke the weed. Number 64, The Shark. God bless the soul and the life of the man John Tinta, who made a name for himself as Earthquake in early 90s WWF. So naturally, when WCW came calling for foes to fight the newly acquired Hulk Hogan, Tinta was on that short list, and although they couldn't call him Earthquake, they changed his name to the Avalanche, which morphed into this character known as the Shark, which was Tinta's Dungeon of Doom persona. Here, Tinta was dressed up to look like a literal shark, Yes, literally a shark man, and solely based on how ridiculous the face paint looked, the shark gimmick definitely deserves to be on this list. Sorry, John Tenta. Number 63, Dean Ambrose, the germaphobe. This one I thought would be fun to throw in the list as it's one of those things where we take a beloved figure and we try not to completely change their gimmick, but transform them into something they are not. And that is a recent case that we had here with John Moxley in his latter days as Dean Ambrose in WWE. You see, just before this final run, Ambrose Rose was turned heel, which was problematic in of itself, but then Vince McMahon and the WWE writers attempted to have Moxley endure this very strange character shift, where Ambrose was something of a germaphobe, I guess. It's really hard to make heads or tails with what the idea was supposed to be, and it was clear that Moxley, who became so fed up with the company at this point, that he would soon leave for All Elite Wrestling. Number 62, The Boogeyman. Look, it's the boogeyman and he's coming to get you okay oh uh, yes the boogeyman of all gimmicks graced our screens in 2005 this gimmick literally came and went out of nowhere i actually think and would argue that is more remembered for its later sporadic appearances more so than the actual run of the gimmick in 2005 WWE. I understand the gimmick may have got over to a degree. The look and the gimmickry and the eating of the worms is enough for me to remember this as an all-time bad and hokey gimmick. I don't know. Fight me on it. Number 61, Jillian Hall. Jillian Hall came up through OVW from 2003 to 2005, and then she was finally called up to the WWE main roster. Now, Hall did okay for a while under a few different managerial roles. In particular, for the purposes of this list, we are going to cover the singing gimmick, which coincided with Hall getting more ring time. You see, the idea was she was one of these people who think they can sing but can't you see and if this wasn't enough hall was given a tasteful gimmick where she had this insane mole on her face that just kept getting bigger and bigger until it literally pretty much consumed her whole face 60 the ladies man slash dancing lance storm some guys just work as a wrestler some guys are just themselves and they're good wrestlers Lance Storm is the definition of one of those guys. Lance Storm doesn't need a gimmick. He just needs to get over by doing what he does, and that's fine. In fact, through Storm's career, that had been kind of his whole gimmick, was that he needed no gimmick. And if you thought he was boring, well, so what? And that was actually the predication of his WCW character, 
and also how Storm basically spent most of his time in WWE. And you can imagine after a while though, Vince just couldn't leave well enough alone. And for whatever reason, Storm was saddled with this dancing badly gimmick. And Storm has actually went on record to say that Vince was just such a genuine fan of the gimmick and the idea that Storm just couldn't say no. And so Storm went on with the awkward gimmick, which turned even more awkward after he paired up with Val Venus and the two became, how should I say this, the most well-endowed tag team in the company? Number 59, Avatar. Ah yes, the WWF new generation movement of the mid-90s is an absolute treasure trove of wrestling sadness. In fact, the era makes up a significant portion of this list, quite frankly. Here we pick on Al Snow. Al Snow cut his teeth in southern promotions like Smoky Mountain and the USWA, and in 1995, finally got the call that the WWF wanted to use his services. And upon being called up during this era, he was saddled with the gimmick known as Avatar, where Snow wore ridiculous masks. Apparently the idea was based off of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which Power Rangers was insanely over with the kids at the time. Fortunately for Snow, he only suffered through this a matter of months before being rebranded as a rocker with Marty Jannetty, and later his best work as just Al Snow with the head gimmick. Number 58, Stuttering Matt Morgan. Matt Morgan was a staple of the WWE's OVW system in 2002, and was in there with the likes of John Cena and Brock Lesnar, and seemed to have a very bright future. And in late 2004, Morgan was invited to the main roster and the SmackDown brand, where he rubbed shoulders with Lesnar and even had a Royal Rumble appearance. For whatever reason though, Morgan was then taken off TV but quickly repackaged with the stuttering Matt Morgan gimmick. You see, the idea was is that he would stutter and then people would make fun of him and then he would beat them up. Simple enough, I suppose. But man, was this gimmick ever so embarrassing. Morgan would then end up being released in July of 2005, just short of a year of being on the main roster. However, Morgan would go on to have modest success in TNA wrestling in the years following. Number 57, The Stalker. Ah yes, Barry Windham. Windham is another guy much like Lance Storm that we spoke about earlier that is just much better left alone. Wyndham was a workhorse member of the Four Horsemen in the NWA, and this is where Wyndham excelled, even though years earlier he had cut his teeth in the WWF and even wrestled at the first incarnation of WrestleMania. Wyndham would return to the WWF in 1990 as the Widowmaker, which was a pretty simple gimmick that for all intents and purposes, wasn't much of a stretch from the Wyndham that we knew, but he still wasn't used well. But this 1996 incarnation of Barry Wyndham called the Stalker, well, it was just weird. The Stalker was supposed to stalk people, we suppose, and was just kind of like a, a hunter, I guess a hunter of people. We don't really know because no one really knew even the announcers would just call him Barry Windham half the time. Luckily, we were not exposed to the stalker for long, and Windham was on to being a blackjack and then back to being himself once again. Number 56, Naked Midian. The real life Dennis Knight was first introduced to us in WCW as Tex Slazinger. WWF fans would first know him as the pig farmer Phineas Godwin, but after that gimmick went to the hog pin, Knight would eventually be rebranded as Midian. Midian was a follower of The Undertaker in real life and on screen as a member of the Ministry of Darkness. In the Ministry, Midian was nothing more than a numbers guy and a lackey. But after that group disbanded, Midian was just left to make sporadic appearances. And then that parlayed into this naked Midian character where Knight would appear randomly wearing nothing but a fanny pack and thong. By January of 2001, this got unfunny with everybody, 
and Knight's run with the company would come to an ultimate end. Number 55, Oklahoma. I'm going to try to summarize this as best as possible, so hear me out. Jim Ross, beloved Jim Ross, battles Bell's palsy in the latter part of the 90s. You see, in addition to being an announcer, Ross was always part of the hierarchy of the WWE. And that would be in conflict over the time with a lot of performers and even the writers of WWE. So that's where we enter the story with Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara, who had some sort of issues with Jim Ross during their time writing for the WWF. So naturally, one of their first orders of business when Russo and Ferrara blocked to WCW and took over writing that program, of course, they created a character to mock good old JR and his Bell's palsy. And I tell you what, it was the most tasteful thing you've ever seen on television. No, I'm kidding. It is something that literally no one asked for and no one wanted. The character was played by Ferrara himself, who somehow sleeps at night to this day. Number 54, The Dicks. The Toland brothers were developed in OVW and showed promise as young athletic talents that had the look that Vince McMahon is traditionally interested in. Well, the day finally came for them to have their official gimmick debut on the main roster. And the brilliant gimmick that they were given was the Dicks. What can I say about the Dicks other than they were a couple of super sculpted dudes that were dressed up as Chippendale dancers and that was literally the idea. Talk about an occupational gimmick. These guys, I guess you could say, were the 2000s equivalent of the American males. Play the music. American males. Number 53, Farting Natalia. Luckily, Natty Neidhart will be remembered mostly for many, many better things she has done over the years. But this right here is something that the list just can't forget. In 2012, a heel Natalia was paired up with Beth Phoenix. One day during a backstage interview, she farted and then, well, the idea was she just kept farting. Over and over again for months and months. It was a running gag on WWE TV whenever they needed a laugh. There would be a segment written where Natalia would end up farting. So to Natalia's credit, she rolled with the punches and went through this and came through on the other side for the better, I would say. And eventually the gag became tired and now it's almost a distant memory for most wrestling fans. Almost. Number 52, The Fake Kane. Oh boy, you know, what would the list be without an imposter gimmick somewhere? And this one was a strange one. You would think someone would have learned after the 1994 debacle with The Fake Undertaker that this angle wasn't a good idea. But no, the angle was relaunched with Kane in 2006, where Luke Gallo started appearing as the imposter Kane and promos these promos led to a match where the imposter actually won only to have the real Kane avenge the loss the next night rip the guy's mask off and throw him out the door never to be seen again and all I can really say here is a waste of time if you're gonna do a gimmick like this make the unmasking or just at least make something about it worth watching. Number 51, who? Jim the Anvil Neidhart was a staple of the WWF for years as a member of the Hart Foundation. And after the team split and Bret Hart went on to superstardom, that left Anvil, well, basically the odd man out. He would struggle to find relevance for really the rest of his career, but he was shortly recast as a character named who? You see, who was just a random guy placed under a mask and the whole idea was that the gimmick was based off an old Abbott and Costello comedy routine. Vince McMahon was allegedly very fond of this routine. You'll also see just how silly this proposed idea for Neidhart was. Vince and company must not have been too fond of him as I struggled to ration why Brett got so much 
while Jim Neidhart got so little. At number 50, The Governor. Ah, yes, TNA Wrestling was ripe through the years of spoiled gimmickry. This one is something that most fans probably don't even remember simply for the fact that it was used for just a short period of time. While most fans remember her as Daphne in her WCW days, Daphne never ended up doing the WWE thing, really. And after WCW closed, she worked the indies and also found herself working for TNA Wrestling. She was just kind of there, though. So eventually, her gimmick was changed up briefly to this governor character. You see, Sarah Palin was a polarizing figure in American culture at the time. She was governor of Alaska and in 2008 would end up running for vice president along with John McCain's political ticket. This was in the news all the time, so Daphne cosplayed as Palin as part of an angle with the beautiful people. Long story short, it didn't last long. And as one of the stranger impersonation gimmicks to witness, Daphne sadly passed away recently in 2021. Number 49, a battle cat. This man's name, Dean R. Peters, and originally he was known to the wrestling landscape as Barry Boone. Boone began in Portland wrestling and was used as an enhancement talent for the WWF in the late 80s before doing some stuff in Japan. And upon returning to the WWF in 1990, Boone became Battle Cat. And Battle Cat, you see, I guess, was a half man, half cat who would pounce around and ricochet off of stuff because, you see, he had cat-like reflexes. And in a bizarre twist in the story on an episode of Wrestling Challenge where Peters made his debut with the Battle Cat gimmick, he went over a talent by the name of Bob Bradley, who would actually take over this gimmick upon Peters' departure from the WWF. Number 48, Beaver Cleavage. Charles Warrington is best known as Mosh and one half of the Headbangers tag team. But after that gimmick had seemingly run its course and we were in the throes of the Attitude Era, Warrington, like many, went through a change of gimmick. And well, this one is thought to be a Vince Russo creation, as it just has his fingerprints all over it. The basis of the character was a tribute to the old TV show Leave It to Beaver, and Warrington appeared as an overgrown man-boy who had a very bosomy mother aptly named Mrs. Cleavage. And the vignettes were full of innuendo and somewhat entertaining, but the concept just did not play out well on WWE TV. Warrington looked silly, and soon he ditched the gimmick and became just Chaz. Number 47, Johnny B. Bad. Hey, Mark Mara, welcome to WCW. Uh, yes, we can't wait for you to start, but before you can, uh, we just have one big favor, and that's that you absolutely tan the ever-loving daylights out of yourself and become somewhat of a black man. Can you do that for us? So yeah, Mark Merrow, hell of a guy, and the gimmick itself, not the worst. This is best Little Richard impersonation, of course. But this really isn't about the gimmick, more so how Merrow tanned himself into oblivion for it. Merrow chose wrestling after a pretty average career in the boxing world. And this was the gimmick that most WCW fans remember him for. Of course, later on, he would become the wild man in the WWF, as well as Marvelous Mark Marrow. And he currently goes around the country giving motivational speeches to kids in junior high and high schools. Number 46, a real man's man, William Regal. This one is a pretty weird one and falls in the file of things that are just better left alone. Regal was a legit tough guy from England. The fans were used to him as an English blue blood type character. And while that character wasn't the best, he did play that part to a T. So confused was I and many fans when vignettes started airing for Regal on WWF TV in 1998 where he claimed to be a real man's man and followed it up by showing Regal in these very manly situations like cutting down trees and shaving with a straight razor blade. 
So as fans are supposed to believe this guy that we've seen as an English guy for years is now all of a sudden some construction worker in America that just found his way to wrestling. So it deserves to be on the list. Number 45, Wrath. Wrath will finally close out our trilogy of WCW's Mortal Kombat characters from the late 90s. Wrath gets credit here and comes in a little higher on the list because of the fact that the man himself, Brian Clark, was a recipient of at least a few other questionable outstanding gimmicks during his time. Prior to becoming Wrath, fans knew him from the WWF as Adam Bomb, a nuclear-born monster from Three Mile Island. Wrath was actually given the biggest push in WCW of those three characters, he, Mortis, and Glacier. And Wrath was actually given a win streak gimmick for a while, but it ended way before it made any kind of significant difference for him or his pocketbook. Number 44, Lou E. Dangerously. Lou DeAngeli was the man's name, and he was first widely known as Sign Guy Dudley the mute sign-holding manager for the Dudley Boys. Now, ECW has, for the most part, gotten a huge pass on this list, but here, Louis dangerously checks in. After the Dudley Boys left for the WWF, they didn't take the sign guy with them, so he was still around and had to figure out something to do. The idea was for him to spoof Paul Heyman's former NWA and WCW gimmick of Paul E. Dangerously and become Lou E. Dangerously, who I guess was supposed to be Paul's cousin or something like that. And Lou carried a giant cell phone and did his best to do the Paul E. shtick, but it's still a rip-off gimmick, and that's why it makes the list. Number 43, Outback Jack. Time to kangaroo down, yes. The man, his name was Peter Spillsbury, and was brought up in Stampede Wrestling and was quickly shipped to the WWF with his gimmick in 1986. The gimmick was a response to the insanely popular film of the time, Crocodile Dundee, and Spillsbury, being a legit Australian, was apparently so perfect for the role that he was brought up to the WWF super early in his career. And Jack actually got a push starting out, but ultimately ended up as basically an enhancement talent. Fans can look back at the old vignettes of him driving his Jeep through the outback and getting into all kinds of crazy Australian shenanigans. I Jack abruptly left the business in 1988 and has done very few media appearances or appearances in general since then. Number 42, Jimmy Wayne Yang. James Yoon is the man, and we first saw him in late era WCW as Jimmy Yang, part of the Young Dragons. And when WCW was purchased by Vince McMahon, Yoon was ultimately let go in 2002. And Yoon wasted no time and worked all over the world until finally landing back in the WWE as a Keo and part of a going nowhere tag team with Sakota. Eventually, he was fired again in 2005, only to return a year later in 2006 as this gimmick, where the man was, I guess, forced to play a redneck gimmick, where you can imagine was a stretch for an Asian American born in Los Angeles. This gimmick was super lame. He was eventually let go once again in 2010. Number 41, the ECW Zombie. Tim Calkins started wrestling in 2001. Being a Long Island guy, Calkins was trained at the Monster Factory, which is only fitting given this gimmick here, but anyway, I digress. Calkins worked in the Northeast Indies before going to Puerto Rico. And that's when he caught the attention from WWE and ended up working a dark match on a Monday Night Raw. And the very next night, he was talked into appearing as this ECW zombie character. This was more like a one-night rib as Calkins was dressed up like a zombie, 
only to get the ever-living daylights beat out of him by the Sandman and his Singapore cane. This would send him back to Puerto Rico where he kept wrestling for years and was still active up until his untimely death in 2015 at just 38 years old. Number 40, Kizarni. I remember the vignettes for this character and I was actually pretty hopeful. I mean, it made sense to me, an evil wrestling carny. I mean, I know my wrestling history and obviously there are huge connections to carnivals and that whole culture. And Nick Chekovich was the man's name who was saddled with this task and look, like I mentioned, I have nothing against the gimmick itself or the guy. WWE just failed to do anything with it or expand on it. The gimmick debuted on SmackDown in 2007 and failed to captivate out of the gate. And when fans wanted to see a little something more before getting behind it, no one could figure out what that was. And Kazani was released less than a year later. Number 39, Akeem the African Dream. Known for years as One Man Gang, when Gang made it to the WWF in 1987, he was paired with legendary manager Slick. And about a year or so into the run, it was decided that One Man Gang was done and the man was given the gimmick of Akeem the African Dream. One day, out of nowhere, his manager Slick just decided, oh yeah, this man is actually from Africa, not just Africa, but a deep African ghetto, where viewers were then treated to a segment where Akeem was in this ghetto with a fake jive accent and tribal dancers frolicked in the background. Yes, that's actually how it went down. And yes, it was as borderline or openly racist as it sounds. Take your pick. Number 38, Mike Awesome in WCW. Mike Awesome became a name in America through ECW where he was world champion. WCW used him as just Mike Awesome at first. But when Vince Russo got a hold of him, bro, he did become the fat chick thriller, bro. And then he became that 70s guy, bro. Both of these gimmicks were quite atrocious. I can't really decide which one was worse than the other. These gimmicks crashed awesome stock quite a bit. He did rebound a little bit as part of Team Canada as WCW closed down. But then when WWE absorbed WCW in 2001, Awesome was basically treated as an afterthought. Sadly, in 2001, Mike Awesome died of a suicide. Number 37, Tommy Dreamer, a regular guy. Tommy Dreamer is a guy that'll always be synonymous with ECW. The guy was literally the poster child for extreme wrestling in the late 90s, early 2000s for that company. Not only that, but Dreamer stayed loyal to that brand all the way until its death. But Dreamer almost immediately landed with WWE as a numbers guy in the invasion angle, naturally representing his ECW lifeblood in that story. Well, after that all fizzled out, Dreamer was left to be just himself, the innovator of violence. But that wasn't good enough. He was soon given a character that he was attempted to portray where Dreamer was quote unquote just a regular guy and would tape a series of vignettes and also do all these backstage segments that showed him just doing gross thing after gross thing, which mainly included eating things that had fallen out of dirty places like toilets, garbage cans and the like. Dreamer suffered through this for about six months or so and then he was allowed to go back to being himself which I guess was how long it took Vince McMahon to stop laughing at the bit. Number 36, Mordecai. Kevin Furtick previously entered the list as Kevin Thorne, the wrestling vampire. But here, this character, his first big WWE character, was the antithesis of that vampire character as this fellow named Mordecai. Mordecai was meant to be a religious type character who was on a crusade to rid the world of sin. As with pretty much every case ever, wrestling and religion just do not mix. 
and this was another one of those occasions when it comes to matters of faith and politics you must tread very very lightly as to not upset the masses the mordecai character did not last long but did flirtatiously feud with the undertaker number 35 norman the lunatic mike shaw was a mainstay of the latter days of stampede wrestling in canada and when the company closed in 1989 shaw was given the opportunity to work for wcw and came in as this character norman the lunatic where Shaw played an escaped mental patient being led around by Teddy Long with a key. No disrespect to Shaw, I guess this gimmick seems fine on paper, and people may even look at this one and go, come on, it's not that bad a gimmick. Just trust me, okay? As someone who lived through it, while I was maybe five or six years old child at the time, we even knew then that it was hokey and cringy, and something that you would be embarrassed to let your friends see on your television, which to me is what this list is all about. Number 34, Van Hammer. We previously saw Hammer here inducted as Major or Private Stash from the Misfits in Action stable, but here we pay homage to his original WCW gimmick, Heavy Metal Van Hammer. At first, Hammer was pushed as a rock star type gimmick, which as mentioned earlier, rarely can we get wrestling and music to mix properly, it's just hard to do. What makes that even harder is that when you give a guy a gimmick as a heavy metal guitar player, and he can't, unlike a guy like Honky Talk Man who was a heel, so it was part of the gag that he actually didn't play, Hammer was supposed to be a huge baby face, and you can imagine this did not work at all. Eventually, the hammer would fall, and he would end up losing the guitar, but he would actually continue to be a mainstay of WCW for most of the 90s, all the way up until its death in 2001. Number 33, The Mexicools. It's WWE in 2005, and you have three celebrated past stars from Mexico and WCW, ECW on your roster, and you're attempting to bolster and create a cruiserweight division, what do you do with them? Well, you give them as borderline of a racist gimmick as possible and watch them parade out there for your enjoyment. That's what you do. The Mexicals would ride to the ring on literal lawnmowers called, get this, Juan Deers. The team of Juventud Guerrera, Psychosis, and Super Crazy would not be long for WWE TV as a whole group. In the end, Hoovy did end up with a cruiserweight title run, and Crazy stuck around for a few years, but was mainly used as a jobber. Number 32, The Toxic Twins. It's 1991, and we are at the relative just after peak of the Ninja Turtle craze, and you enter two jobbers, Dwayne Gill and Barry Hardy who took it upon themselves to have Ninja Turtle suits made. Their brilliant idea was that they could not only wrestle once a night as themselves, but they could also have this hooded gimmick and get paid twice as much. Well, it didn't exactly work out this way. One fateful day where Vince McMahon reportedly made a snap decision to put the team out there at a TV taping. The crowd quickly turned on this, as you could imagine, as the Toxic Twins, Tommy and Terry, were left to be flipped back on their shell and never to be seen from again. Number 31, the Dynamic Dudes. Shane Douglas and Johnny Ace in the early 90s, WCW became the Dynamic Dudes. And they were a couple of skater dudes from California who were actually from Minnesota and Pennsylvania, respectively. What made this gimmick lame, much like the earlier mentioned Van Hammer, is the dudes would carry skateboards to the ring that unlike Darby Allen in present day, neither Douglas or Ace had any business being on a skateboard whatsoever 
or they had any clue how to even roll on one of these things. And that was bluntly obvious to anyone watching. 30, the dog. Al Green was first brought into WCW as one half of a tag team with Kevin Nash called the Master Blasters. After that team disbanded, Green wavered around the WCW mid card for years and was a part of a few different tag teams. Green went missing from WCW TV for a few years and upon returning, found himself in a whole different era and was mainly used as an enhancement talent. But in 2000, Green would actually find himself getting main WCW TV time by teaming with Brian Knobs as The Dog. No, not Dog the Bounty Hunter, but just The Dog, where Al Green literally acted like he was a literal dog, or he went around trying to attack people and eating random things. Hey, is this where Tommy Dreamer got the idea? Number 29, Friar Ferguson. We covered Mike Shaw earlier as Norman the Lunatic, and you would think that would be the last time we'd hear from him to be known as the Mad Monk, if you will. At least the people responsible at least halfway knew that it was bad because it was quickly dropped. On top of that, allegedly there were even members of the Catholic Church of New York who had cornered Vince McMahon about an issue with the gimmick. And it's just another one of those instances where wrestling and religion really do not mix. Number 28, The Gambler. Jeff Gann is the man's name, and he was a WCW power plant developed talent who debuted in WCW in 1990 under the name Jeff Gamble. And in 1992, he switched his name to the gambler this character was like a cd underworld gambler and gan stuck with this gimmick for years and that's why he makes this countdown here pretty high up albeit if you turned into wcw b shows in the late 90s you probably saw him get beat up a time or two and ultimately, Gan never did anything but the gambler, and as far as I can tell, retired from the business after being released by WCW in 1999. Number 27, Renegade. It's WCW in 1995, and having just brought over Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff was pulling out all the pages from the Hulk Hogan playbook. Long story short, they wanted Ultimate Warrior, and they promised someone like the Ultimate Warrior, and in the end, we got the Renegade. The man by the name of Richard Wilson had the unenviable task of having to be an Ultimate Warrior clone in WCW, and WCW, to their credit, were committed to the bit and gave Renegade a decent push for quite a few months out of the gate and they did a great job of selling the idea to a degree but at the end of the day renegade fell flat and there was no way to recoup any kind of momentum eventually his push fizzled out and he was distanced from hogan or any other main event star for that matter eventually ending up as pretty much an enhancement talent for wcw in the late 90s and WCW actually ended up releasing Wilson in December of 1998. And just two months later, Wilson would sadly end his life at just 33 years old. Number 26, Saba Simba. Tony Atlas is like the Johnny Cash of professional wrestling. He's been everywhere, man. And while Tony had a successful go around his first time up in Connecticut, the second time, not so much, as he was saddled with the gimmick of being an African tribesman named Saba Simba, where Atlas, who was born in Roanoke, Virginia, had to act like he was just captured and brought to America straight out of an African jungle. The gimmick, while bad for its time, aged even worse. Even more interesting looking at all this in hindsight is that Kamala doesn't get nearly as bad of a rap when in fact 
these two literally had the same gimmick, except Kamala was just the heel version of it. Number 25, Kerwin White. At least Saba Simba didn't have to completely change nationalities because that's what we ended up with here with Kerwin White. Wrestling fans, of course, know his face better as Chavo Guerrero Jr., who spent memorable time as a mid-card performer in both WWE and WCW. Well, in 2005, Chavo experimented with a character by the name of Kerwin White. You see, the character was more of a circumstantial one for storyline arc, as Chavo was embroiled in a feud with the Mexicools, who we did cover earlier as the faction of Latino wrestlers riding lawnmowers. Anyway, Chavo denounced this group as a representation of all of Latin Americans. So in turn, Chavo denounces his heritage and becomes Kerwin White, a white suburban male who drove his golf cart to the ring. You can't make this stuff up sometime. Number 24, Black Rain. Dustin Rhodes has had to live up to quite a bit over the years, being the son of legend Dusty Rhodes. And usually that doesn't work out well for the son, but you have to give Dustin all the credit in the world as he has never given up and he's ended up making quite the career for himself throughout the years when you look at it as a whole. Well, in 2007, Rhodes found himself in TNA Wrestling in need of a fresh gimmick, so he created Black Rain who essentially was somewhere in between a twisted version of Gold Dust and the failed Seven character from WCW. Black Rain would carry rats and stuff like that to the ring long before Eric Rowan. Dustin will probably admit himself that this character probably wasn't his finest work. Number 23, the superhero in training. Beyond some brief appearances in the late 90s ECW, fans came to know Rosie upon his WWE debut in 2002 as one half of the three minute warning tag team. And Rosie teamed with Jamal, who would later become Umaga, and the two were an impressive powerhouse tag team for about a year before Jamal was first let go by WWE and that left Rosie without much to do so he was paired with the Hurricane who was a superhero character and Rosie became the Hurricane's superhero in training and the acronym would be spelled out on his poorly made shirt if for some reason you didn't get the gag already. Rosie was the older brother of the man we all know today as Roman Reigns. Sadly, Rosie passed away in 2017. Number 22, Duke the Dumpster Drossy. Michael Drossy was the man and he started wrestling in 1990 and cut his teeth for a few years until gaining attention from the WWF. Part of the long, fabled, and well-covered new generation of wrestlers that appeared in the 1994-95 era of the company, where the WWE was in a midlife crisis, it seemed like, and literally everyone had to have some sort of occupational gimmick. Enter Duke the Dumpster Drossy, the wrestling trash man. Due to his size and the fact that his gimmick even managed to get over to some degree, Drossy actually stuck around with the gimmick for a couple of years before leaving at WWF in 1996. Number 21, MVP Abe Knuckleball Schwartz. Before the MVP we know of today, the OG MVP was Mr. Steve Lombardi, arguably the most beloved enhancement worker of all time, most known as the Brooklyn Brawler in his heyday of the WWF in the 80s. Lombardi experimented with a fresh gimmick in 1993 dubbed MVP, where Lombardi painted his face like a bizarre looking baseball player from the Outsiders. The gimmick didn't appear much on TV, but was dug out a year later 
when the Major League Baseball went on their infamous 1994 season strike and Lombardi brought it back out and they rechristened the gimmick Abe Knuckleball Schwartz. You can imagine this went over about as well as the baseball strike of the time, which you guessed it, didn't end up lasting too long. Number 20, Isaac Yankum DDS. Glenn Jacobs developed for a few years in the Southern Territories. Ultimately, we all know him today as Kane, but before that, he was first brought to the WWE in 1995 as yet another one of the occupational gimmicks of the time. If we were gonna have a trash man, a plumber, and a teacher, well, we might as well have a dentist. In story, Isaac Yankum DDS was Jerry Lawler's dentist and was brought in to further bolster the feud with Bret Hart, who was the main attraction of the WWE at the time. While the gimmick may not have been too bad, Jacobs got it over to a degree, my opinion is, because people just hate Dennis so much. Either way, the job was never gonna go far, and Jacobs was pulled back down to the territories before being repackaged in 1997 as Undertaker's brother Kane. Number 19, The Black Scorpion. Ole Anderson was booking WCW TV at the time. It was Ole's job at the time to direct the run of the man called Sting, who was finally atop the card as champion and the company's key babyface. Well, legend has it that Ole was intent on bringing the Ultimate Warrior to WCW, and Warrior was having issues with WWE at the time, so Ole created this character called the Black Scorpion, who was supposed to be a name from Sting's past, which would have worked out great and made all the sense in the world since the two were formerly partners, and it could have been an awesome story if Warrior actually made it to WCW, which he did not. So Ole was left to scramble for ideas since the reveal and the match were looming. And he had no other option but to put Ric Flair under a mask and have him wrestle as the Black Scorpion, which was disappointing to fans since Flair and Sting had battled extensively already at that point. Also, it didn't help matters that the gimmick flew to the ring in a giant spaceship. Yes, that's literally what happened. Number 18, Oz. Kevin Nash struggled, to say the least, early on in his WCW career. Whoever was in charge at whatever time had no idea what to do with the guy. Case in point here with Nash's second WCW gimmick. After he was the master blaster, he became Oz. Inexplicably, Oz was supposed to be exactly what it sounds like, as in the Wizard of Oz. Except Nash was like the Giant of Oz, I guess. It's hard to say, but undoubtedly this gimmick was the absolute drizzles, mainly for the fact that Nash cosplayed as a literal freaking giant wizard. A wizard, brother! Number 17, Arachnaman. Brad Armstrong started wrestling at age 18 in the year 1980 and was, of course, part of the storied Armstrong family. Brad worked seemingly everywhere throughout the 80s and early 90s and was always seen as kind of just a hand, I suppose, as he did a lot of junior heavyweight stuff and was in a lot of tag teams throughout the years. And he was even a masked member of the Fabulous Freebirds. And I mention that because right after that run, he was strapped with this Arachnaman gimmick. Sadly, after digging, can't find much backstory on who came up with the gimmick. If you know something about this, please let me know down in the comments. But of course, this gimmick did not last long because essentially Armstrong was obviously in a yellow Spider-Man costume and Marvel served some cease and desist faster than you could say Peter Parker. Number 16, Laser Tron. The year was 1986 and the laser tag sensation was sweeping the nation. And well, the NWA decided, bro, we gotta get us some of that. And well, Hector Guerrero was given this costume and told 
go out there and do it. So he did. It lasted a little bit, and he flirted with the junior heavyweight belt that they had going at the time. This was perhaps okay then, but you look back on this one, and it just doesn't age well at all. But hey, anytime you can dress in not only a tinfoil hat, but a whole suit, you just got to do it. Number 15, Fantasio. Harry Del Rios started out in the USWA in 1993. And this was Jerry Lawler's Memphis Territory, which was essentially a feeder system for the WWE at the time. Del Rios wrestled there as himself and as a character called Swing Magician. And while the act was quite weird, maybe it had potential, maybe in another time possibly. But you wonder how this barely got on TV. Meanwhile, we were subjected to many, many other bad gimmicks for way longer. Fantasio had exactly one televised match and that was it. He was either never used or was being used again in the USWA for a while until that folded. And Del Rios resurfaced in TNA for one night and actually revived the Fantasio character for an indie match in 2012 which as far as I can tell was his last match. Number 14, The Leprechaun with the Evil Dungeon of Doom. Someone decided that they needed to have a Leprechaun character in that group. So the man was given the gimmick and what else can I say? I mean, it's just like anything else. Didn't stick around too long because well, it was bad. Soon after ditching this gimmick and the Dungeon of Doom disbanded, now we get the one and only Bastion Booger. The gimmick of Bastion Booger was given to Shaw after the Friar Ferguson gimmick didn't work out. Legend has it that Vince McMahon found Shaw so absolutely revolting that he came up with the idea of Bastion Booger and having Shaw dress up in short tights with some kind of top that a male stripper or something would wear. Except you see, Shaw was really fat. And the gag was, is that he was so disgusting. And I suppose McMahon just wanted other people to feel that disgust for the guy. And also need to mention that it's like this was used once and dumped. No, this was literally on WWE TV for weeks and weeks and weeks. Number 12, the pirate Paul Burchill. You get the idea by now that anytime something is a straight lift or an impersonation of another character, no one generally wants to see it. So you enter Paul Burchill here, who in 2005, since Pirates of the Caribbean was a huge movie franchise, you guessed it, someone had to create a wrestling gimmick out of it. Legend is, is that Vince McMahon, who doesn't go to see very many movies, actually found himself watching one of the movies in the Pirate series and found himself enthralled and came up with this Jack Sparrow tribute shortly after. If you've heard that story, let me know down in the comments, or maybe it's something I just Mandela effect, I don't know. Anyway, it didn't last long, as always and then Burchill was repackaged as a guy who would get kind of touchy-feely on his own sister. Number 11, Exanta Claus. I personally love it when Christmas and wrestling mingle with each other. More often than not, it's a light-hearted good time that's nice to see once a year. Well, in 1995, Vince McMahon decided that we needed an evil wrestling Santa Claus because we really need to explain that to kids at the time. This Santa Claus was portrayed by who we would go on to know in later years as Balls Mahoney in ECW, and later WWE's version of ECW. The evil Santa was somewhat managed by Ted DiBiase and was ultimately something done to get him heat. Note to wrestling bookers here, it's fine to do an evil Santa or a good Santa, but let's try to keep it at once a year. Number 10, The Christmas Creature. Glenn Jacobs withstood a couple of bad gimmicks while awaiting his big payday as Kane. One of these would be one of the gimmicks he would don briefly in the USWA as The Christmas Creature. 
We don't know much about the Christmas creature as it was pretty quickly dropped, but we do know that the idea and especially the costume were absolutely awful. Clad in a green suit with candy cane arms and legs and the icing on the cake, gold Christmas garland, brother, wrapped around the body. And oh yes, a hood that looked like a villain from Journey to Center of the Earth. Number nine, the goon. Ah yes, the everlasting treasure trove that was the mid-90s occupation gimmicks. The goon was perhaps one of the worst of them. Wild Bill Irwin we recognized him as. Still, we are told that he is a former hockey player turned wrestler called the goon. Irwin, I don't think, played a day of hockey in his life. Either way, the goon was another one of these horrible gimmicks that were paraded around for months and months before finally being drove out with the Sambone. Number eight, the Ding Dongs. The team is Greg Evans and Richard Sartain, and they started their career as a team called the Rock and Roll Rebels, which were essentially a Rock and Roll Express knockoff team. After a couple years of that, they were brought to WCW in 1989 and were given the gimmick of the Ding Dongs. Jim Hurd, who was running the show at the time, wanted a pair of wrestling hunchbacks that were impossible to pin, but he settled on the Ding Dongs, who were a team that wore bells to the ring and would literally ring an actual bell during the whole freaking match. They wrestled a few matches and were then squashed and on masked by the skyscrapers tag team and pretty much never heard from again number seven seven dustin rhodes returned to wcw in 1999 after a pretty successful stint as gold dust up north for wwe and rhodes began appearing in a series of very strange vignettes where he played this shadowy character that apparently lurked around and peeped in kids windows the segments were interesting to say the least when it came time to debut the gimmick, Rhodes flew to the ring as Seven, where he was what I would describe as a low-rent undertaker, painted pale white. Then, in a matter of seconds, Rhodes cuts a promo on how stupid the whole thing is and literally denounces the gimmick on its first night. This was one of the Vince Russo greatest hits from the WCW era. It's unclear still whether or not Russo meant for the character to be immediately scrapped or if the perception of it was really that bad. Either way, time spent aside, Seven comes in at number seven. Number six, Mentor. Mike Halick is the man's name and he was born in Omaha, Nebraska. But oddly, little is known about his early career besides him traveling to Germany in 1991 and wrestling for the Catch Wrestling Association as Bruiser Mastino. From there, he was brought to the WWE in 1994, and by 1995, they had the Mantar gimmick ready for him, which, as it sounds, was a half-man, half-centaur, and Mantar was decent enough in the ring that he stuck around for a bit and even briefly had Jim Cornette as his manager. And by 1996, he stopped being used and eventually he would end up doing some spots for ECW and would later resurface in WWE as part of the Truth Commission before going back to Germany and then disappearing entirely. Number five, the Yeti. Ron Reese was a seven foot monster of a man who was trained by the legendary Big John Stud, and he found himself in WCW in 1995, where prior to the Halloween Havoc pay-per-view, the Dungeon of Doom had promised a new foe for Hulk Hogan, a huge man who was frozen in a block of ice. The gimmick would be known as the Yeti, and was originally supposed to be played by a returning Jorge Gonzalez. However, Gonzalez left the arena the day of the pay-per-view with an apparent physical issue, and Ron Reese was given the gimmick where at the end of the show he came out and dry humped i mean bear hugged hulk hogan to oblivion dressed in literal mummy bandages the yeti was pretty much laughed out of the building and the gimmick stayed around for a few matches but he was transitioned into more of a giant ninja for the remainder of his existence number four the gobbledygooker the year was 1990 
and the WWE had a mystery egg that would appear on TV every week and we waited for weeks and weeks for the egg to hatch. It just so happened that the egg would hatch on the night of Survivor Series 1990, where a man dressed in a turkey outfit came out strutting to the ring, where he proceeded to dance around with Gene Okerlund. This goofy presentation is enough to cast this into our top 10 here. Three, the Johnsons. Impact Wrestling in its earliest form was known as NWA TNA, and instead of having TV shows, the company at first hinged itself on weekly pay-per-views to sell the product. Part of the thought here was that since the shows were on pay-per-view, it really could be anything goes. So they sent out a tag team named the Johnsons, who dressed in flesh-colored bodysuits with matching masks. The Johnsons, in reality, are Mike and Todd Shane, who would later get a brief shot in WWE as the Gemini tag team. But here, they lasted a few weeks as the wrestling penises. I'm just not sure what else I can say about this other than wrestling penises. That's all I really should need to say, right? Number two, the shock master. Fred Ottman came to debut in WCW in 1993 as a mystery partner for Sting's team at the War Games pay-per-view. Well, they had a cool name, I'll give it that. But the execution, of course, left a lot to be desired. Ottman was given a stormtrooper helmet that was spray painted and lined with gemstones. And he wore a cape and to top it all off, this would have been silly enough, but infamously Shockmaster tanks his debut by stumbling over a piece of wood, his helmet flies off, and everyone else involved in the angle tries not to pee their pants with laughter, and despite the embarrassing debut, the gimmick and match went through as planned, and then from there the Shockmaster stuck around briefly, but of course, would never shake the embarrassment of his lackluster debut. This is it, folks. We've come a long way. Not gonna waste your time now. Let's go. Number one, T.L. Hopper. There had to be one. There had to be a worst. And as far as I'm concerned, this is it. The wrestling plumber, T.L. Hopper, which stood for toilet lid hopper or something like that. The man is Daryl Anthony, and he went all around the regional circuits in the 80s and 90s as Dirty White Boy, and Anthony was thought of pretty highly around this time as a worker, and in fact was even listed as the number 25 wrestler in the PWI 500 in 1994. But in 1996, he made his way to the WWE as T.L. Hopper. You know, it's almost like Vince McMahon knew these gimmicks were doomed, but just did them anyway. It's rather bizarre, as the wrestling plumber is down lower on the food chain to me than the wrestling garbage man. That's it, folks. That's all 100 of the worst gimmicks of all time. If there is for some reason anyone I left out, anyone you want to mention, let me know down in the comments. It's really hard to just lower it down to 100. I think it's a pretty, pretty dang good list. A lot of love of current and new subs. Please make sure the bell is on so you can support us. Also, you can follow us on Twitter. That's at PW Planet. And dropping a like on this video would help out the channel algorithm all so much. We'll catch you next time on Pro Wrestling Planet. Yo, 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 it's your boy JTG, a.k.a. J the God, one half of the illest tag team ever crime time. And you are watching Pro Wrestling Planet. And we all know Pro Wrestling Planet is about that money, money. Yeah, yeah, that money, money. Yeah, yeah. Cheer.